Hey, good morning, Open Door family. I am so excited to get to bring you the Word of God this morning. I know I'm in a bit of a different place, uh, but, you know, I'm trying to kind of switch it up a little bit uh, so that we can feel like we're going to different places, even if we're just kind of at home uh, for worship. So, listen, I want to just jump right into this Word because I am just excited about what God wants to share, y'all. It hit me first. And whenever a word hits me and I get to share it with you, the people that I love, I just feel so honored. So Pastor Tim has been uh, teaching us about the necessity to understand how to study the word of God. Why the word of God, knowing it, studying it, meditating on it and applying it is so important to our lives. But listen, y'all, as I was thinking about that message, it occurred to me that so often when we talk about things like prayer and study and meditation, many of our eyes can kind of glaze over <laughs> because for whatever reason, we feel like that's boring. You know, some of us, we want to get to the, you know, the miracle harvest season, breakthrough blessing type of messages. And so when we slow it down and talk about the necessity of understanding how to read and study the word of God, sometimes we can check out. And so I want to actually take us in a slightly different direction today because I really want to drive home why it's so important what Pastor Tim is teaching us about. So, you know, the last year or so, I have been home. And every year I always do, you know, that annual Bible reading plan where you go through the Bible in a year and you have to read a certain number of chapters every day in order to read it through the year. And uh, if I'm honest, I had been doing that really to just kind of check the box of reading the Bible in the year. But this past year, the Lord had been on me. The Lord had been on me about not just reading the words, but really allowing the words to read me, allowing the words to speak to me, to speak to my situation, to, to ponder what God was saying through the writers in order to understand how it applied to my life. And listen, y'all, by doing that, instead of just reading the words to read them, by reading the words and allowing those words to saturate my spirit and my situation, I walked away this last year with such a deep appreciation of God's word. And I've always appreciated God's word. But this past year, I got a deeper appreciation than I've ever had. And there's one particular passage of scripture that I want to share with you today that when I got to the book of Acts, which is one of my favorite books of the Bible, when I got to the book of Acts, chapter 27, it's a story that I had read many, many times before. But I don't know if it was just the season I was in at that moment. The story spoke to me in such a real way. And I want to share it with you today. So if you would, head with me over to the book of Acts. We're going to start reading at chapter 27, verse 10. I want to give you some context before I read this passage of Scripture, though. So as we walk into this passage of Scripture, right before it, uh, we find that Paul is a prisoner on a ship that is headed for Rome. Now, why is this ship headed for Rome? Well, right after Paul had his Damascus Road experience, you know, the, the experience where Jesus appeared to him and said, you know, why are you persecuting me? And, and, and basically commissioned Paul to be a preacher of the gospel. Right after that happened, Paul started to, you know, travel far and wide preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. Well, it just so happened that uh, in a certain part of his journey, he ended up in Jerusalem. And while he was there in Jerusalem, he uh, came upon a group of Jews who were from the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. These were the very religious sect of Jews. And they were angry with him because the gospel that he was preaching essentially contradicted what they were saying. So they were very angry with him and they started to riot. And it got so dangerous for him that a guard had to grab Paul and carry him to safety. And while Paul was in the safety of prison, it came to the guard's attention that there was a plot to kill Paul. 40 Jews came up with this idea on how to kill Paul, they got the approval of the chief priest for this idea too. So they were going to carry it out. And it was when that 
became known by the guards that they decided that Paul needed to leave. And so uh, through a turn of events that you can read in chapter 23 of Acts, he ends up being saved by a commander who takes him out of Jerusalem to Caesarea. And it was there that he got the agreement from King Agrippa to go to Rome, okay? So we walk into a situation where Paul is on this ship heading for Rome. He's on this ship with other prisoners heading for Rome. Acts chapter 27, beginning at verse 10 says, this is Paul speaking. He says, men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to Paul, followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. Skipping down to verse 18, it says, we took such a violent battering from the storm. This is on their way to Rome. That the next day, they, the guards, the centurions, began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. This is stuff they needed, y'all. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. Skipping down to verse 27, y'all, listen to this. On the 14th night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea when about midnight, the sailors sensed they were approaching land. They took soundings and found that the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and found it was 90 feet deep. Fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they, the sailors, dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. Final verse 32 says, so the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it drift away. In the few minutes that I'm going to take with you today, I want to teach from the subject. Don't die in the lifeboat. Don't die in the lifeboat. One of my favorite verses in the Bible, Proverbs chapter 14 and 14 and 12, it says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. You see, early in that story, Paul told the centurion, he said, listen, this is going to be a disastrous trip. We're going to have a lot of loss of cargo and life. Paul is speaking to him, telling him what he sees prophetically. But the centurion decides that he knows better. And so he's going to follow his own way. The centurion decides, well, Paul, you're not a sailor. How are you going to tell me what to do? Well, a few days later, it just so happens that the sailors decide in the middle of the night to try to escape from the ship because things got so crazy. They got so chaotic that they decided the only way that we can survive is if we jump ship and get in this lifeboat. And Paul happens to see this. It's midnight, y'all, middle of the night. Paul happens to see this and he says to them again prophetically that if you leave this ship for that lifeboat, you will not be saved. You know, many of us like to act like 
we came out of the womb saved. Like, you know, we've never done anything wrong. We've never made a mistake. Like we were just born, baptized and sanctified. Many of us act like we don't have a past. But let me tell you something. That's not my testimony. And this morning, as I talk to you and encourage you not to die in the lifeboat, I want to tell you a little bit about me. You see, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. My first time in church was in the sixth grade at, as 11 years old. Uh, I had a classmate invite me to church and I didn't even know what it was that we were going to. But we went to the church thing and the pastor preached a message. He said, God is a father to the fatherless. And that message spoke to my heart because my father had died when I was very young. And I had always thought that if my father had lived, that many of the things that had happened to me would not have happened if my father had lived. And so in telling me that God was a father to the fatherless, he was speaking my language. And from that day, I started to fall in love with Jesus. I got involved with the youth ministry. I eventually became uh, a leader in the youth ministry. I started to teach Sunday school. And when I got in high school around the age of 16, I went to my pastor and I said, I don't know what this is, but I just feel like I'm called to preach. I'm, I'm called to preach the gospel. And my pastor said to me, I've known that about you for years. And I agree. And a year later at the age of 17, I was licensed as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I began to preach and teach the word of God. I began to preach at all types of youth conferences all over the city and all over the state. And when I got to college, I was preaching in college too. I was on fire for Jesus. Y'all, when I got to college, I joined the university gospel choir and I was in all these Christian study groups and I joined a church and, and I was leading a youth ministry and I was doing all these things for Jesus. And then the second year of college, I joined an organization for college women and I got exposed to another side of life in college. I got exposed to, to parties and and, and drinking and dancing and, and boys and all these things that I didn't know a thing about. And in the midst of that, I met a guy who became the love of my life, or so I thought. And this is not Pastor Tim, y'all. This guy, he was a DJ. He used to play music at all the clubs and all the parties and, and, and he was so cute and all the girls liked him and oh my goodness, suddenly I realized that he liked me and I decided that okay, I was going to be with him. Now here's the thing, y'all. In no way did he serve Jesus. He didn't go to church. He didn't even really believe in God. But I was so excited to have this person interested in me that I abandoned ship for the lifeboat. I would go with him to all the different parties that he would DJ at, some in town, some out of town. I was there with him and I was supporting him and encouraging him until one day it occurred to me that I hadn't been to church in a long time. You see, the thing about it is I had to stop going to church because I knew better. I knew that I had no business in those parties. I had no business socially drinking. I had no business with this man who I was unequally yoked with, an unbeliever with a believer. What was I doing? I knew that. And so I had to jump ship for the lifeboat. You see, that boyfriend, though, that I was so in love with, he ended up cheating on me. He got a girl pregnant. And I'll never forget how devastating that was. My heart was totally and completely broken. So much so that I ended up choosing a lifeboat in the middle of that storm that I had forgotten about. The lifeboat of suicide. You see, when I was nine years old, I tried to end my life because of all the dysfunction and all the abuse that had happened to me. 
And when I was 11 years old, I tried again because of all of the abuse and all the dysfunction that happened to me. And so when that situation happened to me at 18 years old, I walked out to a busy road. I was standing on the edge of the busy road and I was looking at the cars driving up and down the street and up and down the street. And I thought to myself, I said, I could just throw myself in front of a car and in an instant I would be gone. That's how devastated I was. But as I stood on the side of the road, y'all, with voices yelling at me in my mind about how horrible that situation was and how could he do this to me and I must not be worth anything and how did I let this happen to me? As these voices were yelling at me in my mind, there was a still small voice on the inside that said, this is not my perfect will for you. There was a still small voice on the inside of me that began to speak the word of God. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And that still small voice speaking the word of God to me in that moment, as a person who had jumped ship, as a person who had chosen my own way, as a person who had decided that I knew what was right. The word of God called me back. And my brothers and my sisters, this is why you have to have the word of God down on the inside of you. Because if you don't have the word of God on the inside of you, how can God speak to you in the storm? You know, we can read scripture, we can memorize scripture, we can even teach scripture. But if we don't allow the word of God to get down on the inside of us, we won't be able to decipher the voice of God from the noise. And this is why on that ship, Paul's presence was so important. Because you see, Paul was the only one on that ship who knew the voice of God. And how did he know the voice of God? Because he knew God's word. And so when God told him that this trip is going to be disastrous, he was able to pick it up in the spirit and he was able to relay it to the other people. But because the other people did not know the voice of God, they did not know the word of God, they chose their own way. And by choosing their own way, they put themselves, everyone on that ship in danger. Don't die in the lifeboat. You see, my brothers and sisters, a lifeboat is never as fortified as the ship from which it came. A lifeboat is a flimsy representation of the ship. I want you to think about this. The iceberg that sunk the Titanic what in the world would it have done to those lifeboats? Lifeboats were never intended to be the ship. Lifeboats were intended as a last resort. They're not designed to withstand the worst conditions that a ship finds itself in. They're not designed to withstand all the weight of the baggage. They're not designed to withstand all the conditions of the cargo. They are weight limited, which is why a lifeboat is never a substitute for the ship. The challenge for us is that when things get choppy in our lives, many of us, we abandon the ship because we are not anchored by the word of God. So when the seas get choppy, we're ready to run to the lifeboat. And what is the lifeboat? Maybe your lifeboat is that woman who's not your wife that you're calling late at night when you just had an argument with your wife. 
Maybe your lifeboat is that bottle that you turn to when things get challenging and you try to drown your discouragement in that bottle. Maybe your lifeboat is pursuing position after position after position that has nothing to do with your purpose, but you're trying to chase worthiness. God is calling us back to the ship. And what is the ship? The ship is his word. We have to be anchored and we have to be grounded in the word of God. So why does studying the word and meditating on the word of God matter so much? I want to leave you with just two thoughts to make this plain for you. The first is this, my brothers and sisters, lifeboats are not designed to sustain you on treacherous seas. Only the ship can do that. You know, many years ago when Pastor Tim and I were, we were talking to pastors of very successful churches, just trying to understand, you know, hey, what are you doing that has created so much growth within your church? You know what they told us? Many of them said, well, you have to think of Sunday in a very general sense. Don't ever preach anything that's going to be complicated. Don't ever preach anything that's going to be convicting because that should be the time when people feel good and they feel comfortable. That should be the time when they get an encouraging message. That should be the time when they leave on a high. But let me tell you something. If people only get high, there's going to come a point where they're going to come low. And when they come low, if they don't have a foundation, they are going to just sink further and further. And so our job as pastors and preachers is not to make people feel good. Our job as pastors and preachers is to help people grow. You may not like what I'm saying. You may not like what I'm saying because it hits you a certain type of way. But my job is not to make you feel good in your sin. My job is to make you see your sin for what it is so that you can get free. And the only way to get free is through the word of God. How do I know this? You see, when you get a cancer diagnosis, it may feel good to have somebody tell you, oh, get ready, your miracle is coming. But when you are writhing in pain, You don't need somebody to just tell you that your miracle is coming. You need to know Isaiah chapter 41 and 10 says, fear not for I am with you. Be not dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. When you are in pain and you need healing, you need Matthew chapter 11 verse 28, which says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. When you are feeling pain and you are writhing in your bed in the middle of the night you don't need me to say that your miracle is coming what you need is Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 17 which says but I will restore you to health and heal your wounds declares the Lord you don't need somebody saying oh just hang on baby God is gonna do it no you need Isaiah chapter 38 verses 16 through 17 which says you restored me to health and let me live surely it was for for my benefit that I suffered such anguish in your love you kept me from the pit of destruction you have put all my sins behind your back you see when you find yourself in treacherous waters you don't need any mamby pamby cotton candy stuff you need the word of God because only the word of God has the power to change situations it's not about a hope or a wish The word of God is a promise. And too many of us are walking around here declaring uh, affirmations. Oh, I'm good enough. I'm smart enough. I'm strong enough. No, baby, you need to declare that I am fearfully and I am wonderfully made. You need to declare the word of God over your life. Before I was formed in my mother's womb, God knew me and called me. You need to declare the truth over your life. Not opinions, not wishes, not laundry lists of hope. Declare the word of God because lifeboats won't sustain you in treacherous seas. And the second and last thing I want to leave you with 
my brothers and sisters, instead of leaving the ship, just try obeying the ship master. You know, when things get difficult, it may feel like you need to jump ship for the lifeboat, for the thing that's comfortable, for the thing that's familiar, for the thing that's always there, but lifeboats will not sustain. We have to learn to obey the shipmaster. Romans chapter 10, verse 14 says, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We cannot say that we have faith if we don't have the word because the word of God is the foundation for our faith. It's not about how I feel, what I wish, what I heard. It's about what God said. Many of us don't even know the voice of God because we don't spend time in his word. You know, I've had so many situations in my life where I heard the voice of God clearly tell me to do something that didn't make sense. And because I heard the voice of God, I was blessed. You know, a few months back, my husband and I, we were in Jacksonville. We were coming home from uh, a few days at the beach and we were driving down a road. It was pouring down rain. And I happened to look over and I saw a man on the side of the road and he was trying to sell barbecue, but nobody was there because it was raining and the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, give that man $500. And you know, my husband is, he's, he's not the, the most free when it comes to the wallet. So I told him, I said, honey, we, we have to give that man some money. God just said to give that man some money. And so he was like, what? But we turned around and we went to the ATM and you know, when you pull up to the ATM, they have on there, you know, a few different uh, multiples of money. You can choose 20, 40, 60, 80, 100. And so my husband, you know, he, he reached for the little 100. And in my heart, I knew God said 500, but I just, I just kind of left it. I was like, okay, 100, you know, okay, fine, 100. And we drove over to the man and gave him the $100. And he was so excited and so grateful and so thankful. But as we drove off, the spirit of God said, I didn't say 100. I said 500. I said, babe. We got to go back. <laughs> God said $500. Pastor Tim was like, are you kidding? I said, no, God said $500. So we turned around and went and got 400 more dollars. <laughs> and we went and gave it to the man. And the man literally started crying in the rain. Just couldn't believe it. And, and, and we just said, you know, God bless you. And and God just keep you and your family. And we blessed him. And, and then we drove off. Y'all, the very next day, the very next day, I got an invitation to speak at a virtual conference. They wanted me to just do a 30-minute talk on leadership. Virtual. Didn't have to go anywhere. And they offered to pay $5,000. Why am I telling you this? Because see, some of us are jumping off the ship because we feel like there's not enough on the ship. We feel like God is asking us 
to do too much. You want me to pray? You want me to study? You want me to serve? You want me to give? That's too much. I'm out of here. I'm coming to tell you, I don't know what's happening in your life. I don't know what situation you are facing. Maybe you're having trouble in your finances. Maybe that's why God just told me to tell you that. Maybe you're having trouble in your body, in your marriage, whatever the situation is, and God has already told you what to do about it, but it seems so crazy, and you're ready to jump to the lifeboat, to the thing that's familiar, to the thing that you're used to, and God is saying, I'm not calling you to comfortable places, baby. I'm calling you to stay on this ship in the middle of the hurricane. The question is, will you know the voice of God enough? Will you know the word of God enough to obey? Obey him. If you want to experience the safety and the protection of God, instead of jumping the ship, you're going to have to learn to obey the ship master. The thing about the ship that Paul was on is that there was a man on that ship who was called the ship master, but he was not the master of the ship. Oh, no. The master of the ship was the one who created every wood fiber that the ship was made out of. The master of the ship was the one who created every water molecule that was slapping against the side of the ship. The, the master of the ship was the one who created the winds and told them where to go and how hard to blow and, and, and when to blow. That's the master of the ship. The question is, who is the master of your ship? Is it you? Or are you even on a lifeboat? Have you decided... That the word of God is irrelevant. The word of God is not necessary. As I close, I just want to ask you this question. Are you ready to jump ship right now? You see, the faith walk is hard. The faith walk is not easy. I'm telling you, it's not easy. There have been so many times when I have wanted to act out of my flesh and God said, that's not my perfect will. And we have to learn to obey. My charge to you today is don't die in the lifeboat. Get in your word and learn to hear the voice of God. We have to study the word of God. You see, Paul gave the word to the centurion on the ship, but he chose his own way because he did not know his voice. God is calling for us to know the voice of God. I want to pray over all of you. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you, Lord, for your people. I pray, God, that I've done what you've called me to do. I pray, God, that I have encouraged them to stay on the ship. When things feel hard and they feel difficult, God, stay on the ship. Get in the word. Don't just read it. Don't just study it. Don't just memorize it, but apply it. Turn to the word, not as a last resort, but as a first line of defense in every situation. Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, that we will live up to your expectations of us. I pray, God, that, that we will make you pleased with how we orient our life. In Jesus' name. Listen, if somebody is watching this and you're saying, I, I, I think what you said makes sense, but I don't even have a relationship with Jesus in order to be on that ship. I'm going to ask you right now that if you have been convicted and you feel like you want to choose Jesus, I'm going to ask you right now to repeat after me. Say, Heavenly Father, on this day, I see my need of you. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your grace. And I choose this day to surrender my life to your Lordship. You are my savior and I am your servant. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Listen, I pray this message blessed you. I pray that you got something from it that you can hang on to, not just for the next week, but for the next month or the next year, that you will deepen your faith in God so that he can show you what his power is capable of. I also want to encourage you, if you are a member of Open Door, I want to encourage you to continue to sow into this ministry, continue to sow into this work. You can look on your screen now and see multiple ways to give. I encourage you to do that. 
Giving is not something we do optionally. It's something we do as an outward expression of our love for God. And so take a moment to give as an outward expression of all the amazing ways that God has given to you. And we will see you next week. Just know that Pastor Tim and I love you dearly and we cannot wait to get together again. God bless you all.